The film, which follows, needs very little comment. Here, Miss X arrives. The big boat is carefully winched out to the water on a slipway at the home of Peter House, Bathner's Trans River neighbour. House can be seen in his white jersey helping out. The very first of numerous problems still be encountered. The trailer, with its large wooden cradle, is partly floating itself, and Miss X won't float off, and efforts are made to ballast the trailer and drag her off with another working crisscraft. All testing was done from the jetty at Duck Point. The crew, apart from Bruce Waterhouse, were new to the business of racing boats and were learning as they went along. It must be remembered that there was no source of power boating knowledge or experience in South Africa at the time. There was no one to turn to and communication with American and British advisors was done by letter or long distance telephone call. Ms. X experienced ongoing irritating little problems which slowed down progress. Bobby, in the checked shirt, spent hours in discussion with Bruce Waterhouse, who was a fund of knowledge about the Rolls Merlin, and his keen engineering ability was useful in problem analysis. Rolls Royce had asked Bruce to assist where possible, although he was not officially seconded to the project by Rolls. Thirty years after the events filmed, Bruce was still able to recall each problem in some depth. As the film shows, once engine problems were resolved, the hull design remained a major problem. The speed was there, but the pitching on the straight was a continued headache. Clearly the weight distribution was wrong, and perhaps the shaft angle too. Propellers were confined to those brought from Campbell. As previously mentioned, the gearbox had to be upgraded, and the universal couplings too. The hull had not been designed for forward control, and the heavy Merlin engine was another possible problem. Being two hours away from the nearest machine shop for minor mechanicals was a further hurdle. 
the tests were being run in the South African winter, which although not like North America, was still cold, with early morning temperatures below zero. It wasn't a good time to be working in the water. Those who watched these early trials were amazed that Bobby persisted, as the boat looked very unstable at times. But Bobby stayed with it and never admitted to being phased by the violent antics of his craft. Discussions went far into the night under the clear winter African sky, often seated around a blazing wood fire, setting up programs for the next day. Now we are at the end of another long day, and the lady is taken under tow again, back to Duck Point and back to more brainstorming. Bobby and Thelma returned to South Africa after their American trip, with Bobby excited by the power and speed of the American Gold Cup boats. He called the team together for a last try to sort out Miss X, but as predicted, the universal couplings failed as more power was applied and numerous other problems were encountered. They were mechanical and might have been solved, but the instability of the craft was a major hurdle which Spur could not overcome. South Africa was still short of strategic materials after the war, and it was not easy to get specialist materials. The gearbox modifications were still not done, and many unresolved problems remained. A final effort was made. At a local regatta on the Vaal River in March 1949, Bothner ran Miss X over a measured mile at 4,000 feet altitude. Despite a very quick first run, the return saw Miss X falter and eventually he had to settle for an aggregate of 70.381 miles per hour, a speed which became the South African unlimited record for the next few years, until Bothner himself lifted it to 90 miles per hour in Sugar 3. This was the last time that the South African public were to see Miss X, who had promised them so much. Reluctant to throw more of his limited means at the project, Bobby had Miss X rebuilt 
to a smaller conventional dimension and more akin to her ventinal origins. This can be clearly seen in the photograph of Miss X II. Power came from a Cadillac V16 engine, reputed to have come from Field Marshal Jan Smuts' staff car. But this redesign did not produce results, and the hull was further reduced to take a V8 block with Edelbrock heads, and with this craft, Miss X III, Bobby was able to dominate local racing for the next few years. The story was concluded when Bobby imported a Hallett designed hull from America, Sugar 3, which carried the American number F12 and was powered by a mercury block with fuel injection. He raced this successfully into 1956 when he was tragically killed in a motor accident. Thelma gave Sugar 3 to Peter Haas, Bobby's great friend and fellow racer. The saga of Miss X is a little known story of a man who loved powerboats and aimed for the highest rewards. Sadly, it was not to be. Miss X and Bobby Bothner deserved so much more. In editing this footage, the producer was able to have the extremely valuable comment and input from Phil Kunz, America's top hydroplane and race boat historian, photographer, and a man who also races classic hydroplanes. Phil informed us that the footage, apart from containing film of the 48 Gold Cup, also included a short section taken at Red Bank, New Jersey. This, Phil believes, may have been through Bobby's friendship with Guy Lombardo, who lived near Red Bank. And Bobby, on his way home from New York, probably stopped there. This race took place a week after the Gold Cup in Detroit. The 48 Gold Cup was a very controversial race. The water conditions were very bad, and with hindsight, the race should have been postponed. It will be remembered for the extremely rough water and the fact that most of the unlimited boats were broken up or badly damaged. They were simply not built for high speeds in these conditions. In the footage, one can see, amongst others, La Hala II, a Ventnor hull driven by Harry Lynn. Suchcrust, another Ventnor with Dan Arena. Miss Pepsi with Clell Perry. Hurricane IV with Morland Weisel. Tempo VI with the band leader Guy Lombardo. And my sweetie, driven by Wild Bill Cantrell. Then there was Miss Canada 3, a hacker craft driven by Harold Wilson, and Miss Great Lakes, driven by Al Fallon, the eventual winner. Skip Along was driven by Stan Dollar, and so long by the famous Lou Faggio. Saint Ambrogio was the only foreign entry, driven by the famous Italian Achille Castaldi, holder of many European records his boat being powered by an Alfa Romeo motor. And then there was Miss Frosty, a Detroit entry driven by Warren Avis, and the power was still provided by a venerable Duesenberg engine. Finally, it was Miss Canada's last race, as she was soon replaced by Miss Canada 4, and she can be clearly seen in the pictures. It is interesting to note in the film Bobby's fascination with design, as several of his shots probe the undersides of boats as they are lifted from their trailers onto the water, and some slow motion shots show the antics of boats on the rough water. In some of the later footage, the very reduced field can actually be seen. In writing about the race in the magazine Rudder in 1948, Lou Apple said the Detroit River resembled the North Atlantic. There were 21 entries, and they were divided into two preliminary heats. The racing that day was full of incidents. Hurricane 4 broke up, and Lombardo flipped tempo trying to avoid a collision, breaking his arm. Miss Pepsi, G99, was a new hull, and it began to disintegrate. The Italian entry, Castaldi's Sant'Ambrogio, broke up, and so it went on. The film footage demonstrates the conditions as the big boats thundered around the corks, leaping in the air, and staying airborne before crashing back into the water. 
The film, Faded with Time, was actually taken using an old handheld 16mm camera, but it still manages to capture some of the drama of the race. On his return, Bobby often spoke about the raw courage of the American drivers. The boats were leaping in the air, often flying and certainly taking a huge beating. The rooster tails, when they really motored, were a hazard to any boat following. Bobby also marveled at how the pilots stayed in their boats, with no harnesses and rudimentary safety equipment. In the end, nearly every boat in the race had suffered severe damage, and the race was the source of much comment and led to the changing of rules for future events. To quote from Lou Eppel in Rudder Magazine of 1948, the month of September, we read as follows, quote, After getting the chequered flag for the final heat, Foster shut down the Allison and was towed to the official stand, receiving the salutes of the spectator fleet in the form of mass hooting of horns and wild blowing of whistles. Foster really won the cup the hard way this year. After he climbed aboard the official dock, a crew boarded Foster's boat and worked feverishly to keep it afloat while it was being towed to the pits. But before the trip was completed, Miss Great Lakes, the winner, became another victim of the Detroit River. A review of this running of the Gold Cup brings out several notable facts. For the first time in the history of the race, the failure of the starting fleet cannot be blamed on engine breakdowns. This year it was hull failure and whittled the field down and down. The fact of the most unambiguous use of 12-cylinder Ellison aircraft engines by the bulk of the entrance proved that the early bugs had been worked out in racing boat installation and also that present speeds of Gold Cup boats require a complete revision of Gold Cup racing rules. On Sunday, August 29th, the day after the Gold Cup race, gave more than ample proof of such a need. Beautifully designed, engineered and constructed racing craft were beaten, broken and ruined, and thousands of dollars worth of time, effort and materials were ready for the scrap pile only because the present rules make no provision for the postponement of the greatest power boat racing event in the world. On his way home via New York, Bobby stopped at the Vetnal plant in Jersey and purchased a beautiful polished mahogany runabout powered by a Grey Marine Fireball 160 horsepower engine which was shipped to South Africa. She was named Vivian II and dominated runabout racing for some years. On his return to South Africa, Bobby determined to give one more attempt to sort out Miss X problems. <laughs>